So um, I've been giving this talk about the history of distance education in Second Life and virtual education in Second Life and so on for some years. So I wanted to change it up this time. And Nellie and I were talking about uh, focusing it more on um, focusing it more on what kind of advice do we want to give to uh, uh, Dex? You're, uh, I'm sorry. Hold on a second, Dex. You're going to want to. Uh, mute yourself in one of those two places so you don't get the the double uh, voice um so we just thought we would kind of uh, focus it a little bit more on how to get education and information how to get information and resources to make your your new exploration if you're new to the new to second life and virtual worlds in general how to make that a better experience so what I'm going to talk about today is just a little bit of the history of distance learning, and then um, I can. There are several versions of that talk that you can find in the Virtual World MOOC 2018, 2018 playlist, and I think at least two other previous years. I'm sorry you're having trouble with the stools there, folks. Um, uh, so if those boxes that are on the back wall, which is opposite to where the presentation is, all of those are URL givers that will give you the, the links to all of the previous playlists and my original um, talks on the history of, of uh, virtual education and distance education is there. Now they're, they're rudimentary, they're not heavily academic, this is not going to be an academic talk. Um, so, but I will talk a little bit about a little history. I'm going to give you a little bit of a guide to the literature in World and Out. I had hoped to put together a list of journals where the research is is um, published, and I didn't do that. And I'll have a note card for that in the uh, virtual MOOC uh, where we are now in the virtual MOOC headquarters later on today. We are also going to be setting up a display space for presenters to leave their PowerPoints and other goodies for you outside of the virtual MOOC headquarters as well. And uh, we haven't decided where that's going to go, probably in the empty space on the other side of the uh, Chilboat Garden. All of a sudden, I cannot see my slide again. <clears throat> I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint on my other screen so that I can see this while we're going. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, resources, and not as in-depth. The note card uh, giver boxes that I'll be putting down as we go have note cards in there that give you a mixture of information um, from new, uh, uh, YouTube videos to links in world to other kinds of um, uh, articles that are available free on the internet and so on. So you'll be able to take a look at that. I have a little bit of a section about finding your people and finding your look. Again, talking, emphasizing more how to find information and playing and learning in virtual worlds. I didn't made this, make this a slide for comments about equipment, but I will tell you a little bit about my journey with equipment so that if you're a newbie and you want to be working in education in, in uh, a virtual world, um, it, you maybe hopefully can learn a little bit from my experience over the last 10 years. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say too is that as I'm talking, I am focusing on Second Life, but the kinds of advice that I'm giving you will work in virtual in in almost every virtual world. In some cases, the search engine in other virtual worlds has not gotten to the level that Second Life search engine is, and you just need to go to the welcome YouTube area videos, where um, most uh, denizens of those of, other uh, worlds uh, articles. Uh, um, if somebody is in the Zoom and in Second Life, could you turn off your audio in one of those places? Because I, we were hearing there for a second from both both uh, virtual both forms of presentation. So basically, what uh, what I was saying in in um, open sim worlds and other virtual worlds, if you find that their search function or their destination guide is not as complete as what you get here in Second Life 
normally in the welcome center of these other worlds, you will be able to find quite a lot of information. It may be a note card on a particular topic. DigiWorlds does a particularly good job of this. Um, and probably other people do, but I'm more familiar with DigiWorlds. Um, in that you've got a pretty much updated note card that gives you information about what's available on that grid, not only for shopping and so that you can create your look, but also for uh, educational event spaces, music, live music places where you can rent a house if you want to, um, the information about how you can buy land, which is significantly cheaper than it is in Second Life. I think about a tenth is what you pay. Um, in DigiWorlds. I, I have four Sims for $20 a month in DigiWorlds and just haven't gotten around to really dem um, developing them yet. So all of those, all of the advice that I'm giving you today is going to work elsewhere. And there are a lot of extremely, um, uh, um, a lot of extremely uh, experienced people in this room here in Second Life um, who can also chime up in the chat and let everybody know what they think is a good way to solve certain problems when you're first in the world. So a little bit about the history. Um, those of you who've seen this, uh, my talk before, you recognize some of these, these uh, um, illustrations. Distance education itself, I'm sure, goes back way before uh, 1728, as long as there were in, people who could uh, write and read and had a, a way of getting messages to each other. I'm sure that um, there were efforts to educate that took place over long spaces, long distances, and so on. But in uh, most histories of distance education and online education here in the U.S. and the U.K., people always mention um, poor old Jacob, uh, Caleb, and I've forgotten his last name, who in 1728 decided he could teach, um, he could teach a distance education course on a penny postcard. And I think it was a shorthand course as well. Um, lots of folks who were, uh, the Pittman shorthand method was, would develop really early. And a lot of individuals who work, who were working with, um, you know, it's like clerical people or, uh, uh, secretaries to wealthier folks were working in business and so on needed to get this kind of information. So you'll see that a lot of these, um, information, uh, history articles, whether they're academic or not, will um, show you all of the. Is there? Um, here's a here's some. I'm going to put out the note cards. We'll start with uh, Caleb in 1728, who was an individual who lived in the colonial U.S. and um, taught through penny postcards. This meant there was a lot of time between completing your assignment and getting your feedback, but what the heck, it was a way that worked. In the 1840s in the, in the UK and the 1850s in the US, and I'm sure somewhere along in the 19th century elsewhere, Pittman's shorthand, which again was this very useful tool if you were in, in business or working as a, um, working as a, uh, uh, a secretary to some wealthier person, Having shorthand was a big skill, and there were thousands of people that um, that were taking these courses. By the end of the 19th century, the numbers for some of the Pittman courses in the United States were in the tens of thousands, and these were, again, correspondence courses. And then there were developments along that uh, came, uh, that are in that line of how our version of distance education was developed having the radio, courses taught on radio, courses taught on TV when TV came along. In the 1980s, National University started a um, very large network of teleconferencing, which is what the that next photograph at the top is. And then back in, not too much longer later, um, the one of the first games was educational games was was developed called habitat and basically it was like a virtual world which is why people talk about it 
in the sense that um, you could get in there and you could talk to people. There were a, a couple of other types of, please don't um, move the slides if you can possibly avoid it. There were a couple other uh, types of um, online, internet-based uh, social gathering things that came out um, in the mid 90s to the to sort of you know like 90, 1996 through the 1998 area but the first real virtual world was this one at University of California in Santa Cruz which was put together by computer science students and an international group of collaborators it was essentially developed as a um, uh, proprietary virtual world only for the students of UCSC and it al had a lot of the features that we see in virtual wor worlds now a welcome center the use of note cards avatars um, various areas set up to look like a, a, a real-life environment insofar as that was possible given the graphics and the coding of the time and then in 2022 in March of 20 2002 excuse me um, the very first resident came to Second Life. Linden Laboratories had set up a kind of a, a, a demonstration space for their various uh, uh, products that they were selling, and they brought in their clients to use these different uh, uh, products so that they could kind of see what was going on. And they noticed when they allowed their clients and their, their set staff into this space that was had a very purpose, you know, just one one purpose to demonstrate, to allow people to see something and how it was going to work. The staff members and the clients staff members were coming back to this space just to goof around, just to talk to people and make stuff and Lyndon figured out pretty quickly this is something that they could sell, that they could sell uh, generally and that they could open up to the public. So they did that. Now the neighborhood that we're sitting in was founded somewhere in the 2002 to 2003 um, area there by Fleeptook, who is a, I think, a University of uh, Cincinnati, um, or was at the time, employee. She was uh, very much involved in education and very much involved in the development of virtual worlds and of using technology in general. Her name in uh, real life is Chris Collins, and she's still out there. She's way uh, oodles and oodles ahead of all of us <laughs> technologically. Um, and I think the last I heard was working on her PhD. But she and a number of individuals founded this area as a managed community um, with rules and laws and a committee and all kinds of interesting things. So that's our legacy here in Chobo. It's a pretty old community. So I want to talk a little bit about resources. Now, on the, on the floor there, you'll see um, a note card giver for uh, the destination guide links, another one for education, uh, in general, and then another one for distance education. I have another one on searching, and I will put that down a little bit uh, later because I think I I didn't name it properly, and I want to take a while to take a look. So each one of these note cards, guys, you should be able to click on them or touch on them and, it, and open them up. So if you right-click on one of these and then click on open or click on touch, you'll see the contents. And you can copy the contents to your um, to your inventory. It will give you a little bit of a folder where this will live. I have looked for uh, resources on YouTube, such as searching guides and um, you know little tutorials about how to search or how to use the destination guide, how to use libraries, that kind of thing. And I have also searched on um, just on the internet in general, picking up the the links to the Second Life um, Wikipedia, uh, the the Second Life version of Wikipedia, the wiki that has all kinds of information about doing all the various things, as well as the destination guide. If, you're a, if you are a member of secondlife.com, obviously you're here. Um, a lot of people will make an avatar and come in world and forget that there are enormous numbers of, of 
of materials available on the secondlife.com. I mean, I think I took about two months to get from buying stuff in the marketplace to actually searching Second Life for information. The wiki has a lot of information. There's a community. The knowledge base is there. There's a ton of stuff that you can get from secondlife.com. So I also linked there. Now this is sometimes true of the websites for the various other virtual worlds as well, that you can find uh, not just support, but also other kinds of things. A good tip to remember if you're going to be a dig uh, an open sim world denizen, a res resident, You'll find that the Kitely market, and Kitely is one of the virtual worlds that we'll visit later in this course, Kitely has a marketplace that allows you to ship your stuff to any other virtual world that you happen to live in. So for instance, I have my land in DigiWorlds, and I hypergrid from DigiWorlds to other hyperlinked um, uh, grids, but I use the Kitely market online the website for the Kitely Market to uh, purchase things to use on my island um, and then have it delivered to me in DigiWorlds. So that's one way to do things. Things that you have here in Second Life um, will not transfer over unless you built them. And then it's kind of futzy to do that. But there are a lot of tutorials out there that will tell you how to do that and tell you how to pick up your inventory from one world to the other. So the note cards um, that I want you to pick up will give you the links to the free articles. I have a couple of academic articles, one in English, one in Spanish. Um, I have a note card with the Searle for the Second Life and Kitely Libraries. Uh, basically, I didn't get to the Kitely Libraries, but you will be getting a talk from Val Librarian um, later on in this course, which will take place on DigiWorlds, and you'll have a chance to meet uh, all some of the staff of the community um, virtual library there, as well as see what's, what the holdings are. I've also given you the link to the community virtual library here in Second Life, which is a great resource. And it's always a good island to just get over there and zoom around and see what's there. The CVL, like lots of libraries around, will have events as well. And the events are a great way to get to know people with similar interests that you have. And we'll talk about events a little bit later. And then I have things that I picked up from doing an internet search, which you can do in your own language. And I'm sure find many, many, many resources as well. And I also searched on YouTube. I did not search on Amazon this time because if you go to the Chilbo Public Library, which is one of the SL URLs that I gave you in one of these boxes, if you, it's just um, up the road on Route 10 there. If you go to the Chilbo Public Library, the main floor are main books about Second Life and Second Life education, law, culture, communities, and so on. Um, and when you click on those book titles, you will see the information about, you know, links out to Amazon and the Amazon description. Some of the Amazon description is reproduced in the note cards and so on. So you can find the results of my uh, not so recent uh, look at Amazon. So that's okay that somebody changed to this slide. Although I'm not sure how far down we went here. Let's see. Yeah, Jen, you're a little bit Jen, far can over. you hear me? Yep. Yeah, can Sorry. you make the slides a bit larger so that they're easier to view for those uh, that are outside SL? Yeah, I don't know how far, how much larger I can make them, but I will also have. Um, You'll share the slides later on. Yeah, yeah, I'll share the slides. I can put the slides up on SlideShare and all that kind of stuff. Let me just Great. watch me try to stretch this. Let's see what we can do here. And then let me move it down a tad so that you can actually see the top of the slide. Is that a little bit better? I thought you could bring it nearer, but I guess not. Oh, um, actually, yeah. if, actually, what I can do, hold on a second and let me use my... The viewer. My camera controls, and I can get personally closer. 
rather than be farther out and then move this up so that this is kind of in the foreground rather than in the back and let me move down my chat exactly yep. that's you and ellie thank you and um let me go back up again so you can see the whole thing i don't want to get too far Okay, so that's sort of center stage. I don't know if you can see these illustrations here because um, I can't. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm still not sure if we're on the right slide. So let me go back a little bit. Can every, somebody describe for me what you see on the slide when it comes up? It's blurry. Um, all right, I'm looking for two. I'm sorry, somebody said something? Yeah, I said that it's, it's, well, now it's great, but it's blurry. Yeah, now it's blurry. So maybe you should go back. Sorry about the mess. No, I think the two, the two is where I want to be, I think. It's still loading. Oh, okay, that's why it's blurry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can, you know, for the second, um, I'm going to do, uh, well, no, I'm fine, Maria. I was going to go back over to where my PowerPoint is outside, but then you won't be able to see it. Okay. Well, now I can it's perfect. It's perfect. It? Okay, great. It's great. All right, let me see if I can get it a little flatter. So here's a little tutorial in camera control. And you can tell after all these years, I still don't know which is up and which is down. So this is a picture of the community virtual library I was visiting over there today. Mainly what they have is literature, geography, history, philosophy, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's a very interesting library to go to. If you join the group, there are tons of events, including a, a book club, um, that is quite good in terms of helping you see uh, meet people who are interested in the things that you're interested in. And that of uh, Slurl that's at the bottom there is in one of these note cards. The one over on the other side is the Chobo Public Library, which, like I said, is a short walk to the north from here along the Chobo Pathways. It has the calendar outside and some of the um, note card givers. But inside is a collection of book covers, and those are the book covers that link to the AmericanAmazon.com. So now I'm going to uh, move to the next slide. Yay, and it didn't take a long time. The next most important thing that you want to do is find your people. And I, I think people that first come into Second Life feel guilty about spending more than 15 minutes in the frame. It's a game after all. Why should I be here? But it's a serious game, and there's an enormous amount of content. There's a lot of stuff to learn. Um, and so I think you shouldn't uh, be at all guilty about sitting down one evening and spending a couple of hours, if you've got it, looking through what's available in the in the viewer itself. One is the distant destination guide, and I'm going to see if I can't find mine and click on it. Uh, that's the map. Wait a second. Um, let me see where the destination guide is. Because if you take a look at the destination guide, I could probably pick it up here. Can I? There we go. When you get the destination guide, it gives you what's hot and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's a newcomer friendly areas are, are one that's a great idea because you can go and learn how to walk and talk and change your clothes, get a list of uh, freebie stores where you can pick up things to create your look that are not too expensive. You can click on international destinations and see recreations of cities and um, states around the world. There are places where people are chatting all the time and you can meet people. There are clubs with live music and other kinds of venues for live music as well. Adventure and fantasy and then games that you can play. So um, while Second Life itself is... And somebody, if somebody has both uh, on, please shut your mic off in Zoom if you can because we're hearing it. Um, or vice versa anyhow the destination guide is a great way to look and the look for things and in one of these boxes there are some links to uh, S, uh, YouTube videos about how to use the destination guides to some of the destination uh, information that um, is on the secondlife.com 
So that's always a way to look. The next thing is to click on search. Let me shut down this mini map here. The next thing is to click on search in Second Life. If you're in the Zoom, you can see the search come up. It has a whole lot of different options from classified ads to destination guide to the land and rentals, people, groups, places. If you're looking for other educators, click on groups. This is a great thing to do. You can also click on events. If there are uh, events that you might want to go to, you can find out what they are. I'm going to click on groups and put in education so the folks in Zoom can see this. And then just search around. I mean, spend some time hopping around, going to things, meeting, meeting people. Um, as you can see on um, the search, when I put in education, you find immersive education. That's a location, physics education, healthcare, open education, best practices, programming, constructive, and then all kinds of universities as well. You can also search on Google for uh, education in Second Life or education in virtual worlds. And that will give you a lot of information as well about where your group is. You know, where are the like-minded people who do what you do? And don't be afraid to talk to folks. That's one of the best resources. And I know when you're first in world for the first time, you have a... a um, Thanks, Judy. You have a, a, a tendency, I think. Well, I did have, have a tendency. I think the first three weeks I was here, I didn't talk to anybody. Um, I, I went to a, an International Society for Technology and Education event, which was a speaker talking about technology and education in general. And I had my little, you know, outfit on that I got as, as, uh, for my first avatar in Second Life. And I realized when I got into the auditorium that I had absolutely no idea how to sit on one of the chairs. And I had walked all the way down to the second row from the, the stage. And it was um, quite, quite an experience as I was standing there sort of blocking everybody's view and people were beginning to yell at me in chat and say, sit down in front, sit down in front. Some very kind person, and it could have been, it could have been Mandy Mimilis or a Thundery Sipo or somebody else. Um, sorry, my cat just fell off the side of the desk. Somebody else from the ISTE group said to me, "Right click on the chair and click on sit here," and I was so grateful. But I literally, I typed in "thank you" and that was it. I made, I made it through my first three weeks without ever talking to a soul. And then I finally started asking questions and meeting people. And some of uh, my greatest friends in Second Life came from those original, uh, those original explorations. Um, a stranger has just written something in the chat, uh, which is so right. When you go through the destination guide, even Second Life doesn't have the staff to keep it updated all the time. And frequently, you can click on something and it'll tell you that it can't find that location. Just go back to the, de the uh, search that you were on and keep going down the list. And eventually, you're going to find the places that are available. For educators, um, uh, ISTE, International Society for Tech and Ed, Virginia Society for Tech and Ed, Virtual Pioneers, all of those have big uh, placards in the um, Kilbo freebie store, which is just across the, the, the way from us where we are now in Second Life. And the links to get there is there. Exactly. Um, Beth is saying, if you're new, everyone you meet was also new once. And a lot of folks remember that era very plainly, and they remember that people help them, and they will help you. Um, also, we have the Virtual Worlds Education Roundtable link in the calendar, because they're going to do three presentations, I think, for us, inviting us over to the roundtable. And VISTI has just remodeled its island. ISTE is in construction, but it's still there, so you can get there. And Virtual Pioneers is right next door. So all of these places are, uh, and other places, there's real education and education, uh, real, real life education in Second Life. There's open education. There's tons of groups that you can still go to and learn things um, about what's being done here and how you can 
um, you can plug into all of that and have a better experience. Now the next thing, of course, is, and sometimes this is the first thing and why you don't actually uh, uh, talk to anybody for a while, is that you want to find your look. Um, and a lot of people will uh, say this, that you'll, that students who come in even to take a short-term uh, project, do a short-term project for a, a course that's a face-to-face -face course or an online course, that's the first thing they want to do is spend time putting themselves together, getting the, the avatar that they want, changing their clothes, not being the generic avatar for too long. Um, so that's something that, that you've got to expect from your students if you're a teacher and you're also going to experience yourself. We have one famous um, uh, educator here in Second Life who, who might even be in this room who has been in the same outfit um, for years and years up until very recently. So it's, it's one of those things that uh, you want to do. Um, uh, I just wanted to read you that Duncan has said one of the developers groups that he belongs to has agreed to hang out in places where newbies tend to show up just to help get them started in SL. That is so lovely. And Oxbridge, as Friday is saying, is really a wonderful place to start out as well as virtual ability. Um, many places have wonderful uh, long kind of, uh, you know, walk arounds that teach you all the skills that you need to need to know. So one my first recommendation there is YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. There are a ton of old YouTube videos by Turley Linden, T-U-R-L-E-Y, that are tutorials to Second Life that are still relevant. There's a lot of modern ones as well. And what you can do is click on the filter at the top of the YouTube search page and click on this year. And you'll find all of the tutorials that are made this year. And there are tutorials on how to get your avatar, how to change your avatar, where to get clothes, how to make, a, make your look how to um, uh, find the freebie stores. And from a, some of the freebie stores are um, in not so great areas. So you want to look and see whether or not you're going to a general area, a moderate area, or an adult area. And some of them are absolutely safe and wonderful. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where somebody you're a little worried about is uh, chatting you up, you can always click on. Um, you know, you can click on another destination or pull up the destination guide, go somewhere else. If you have a home set, and I'm going to be setting up this uh, building for people who are in the virtual MOOC uh, group to be able to set home to this building. Um, and you can also just shut it off and go away. Um, and yeah, Thinker is also giving you an idea uh, uh, about why some people, I wasn't talking about you, Thinker, but uh, you are <laughs> another example of a person who's never changed their their stuff. It's your brand, and if it, if it's your brand, that's really important to be recognizable. So I have a tendency to change everything every day. <laughs> so I like to play with different colors of hair and so on. Um, so I'm one of those guys. But but if you if you want to be recognizable to your students because you're in videos looking that way and so on, then that's another reason to do that. Um, another thing I suggest, and I know a lot of people don't don't want to do this. They want to make sure that everything is free and they're not investing money. Is is to really set up a PayPal account account and put a little bit of money in there. Um, most. Most things in freebie stores uh, and low uh, or affordable stores will be 10 lindens or 50 lindens, 100 lindens. There's no reason for you to go over a dollar for any purchase or even 50 cents. Um, all I'm uh, so there's all kinds of ways to do it. I have to. I have to. Um, I have to. I'm watching the chat here, so <laughs> I have to say. I have to say that I'm uh, appreciating the comments people are making about why they've kind of held the line at some point or another, whether it's with the first avatar or later on. I, I, must, I myself am using a pre-mesh avatar and had a long discussion with a pal of mine yesterday or a couple days back about how mesh avatars uh, don't really work with old clothes. And I have old clothes that I really like. <laughs> so 
I, I am not upgrading my avatar at this point. And, the, uh, and again, um, the Chilbo Educators General Store is right across the way here. And the uh, thanks, Ra. She says Second Life is working on that. Um, in the Chilbo Educator, you're going to get a, when you click on one of the boxes, it's going to give you a ton of stuff. It's going to give you lots of shirts and blouses and lots of jackets and lots of blue jeans and lots of cars and planes and lots of animals and avatars and all that stuff. So you get a, a big, um, a uh, big folder full of lots of goodies that you can use to change your look. And don't be afraid to stay as you are or to go completely nuts. So this in the middle here is um, Pathfinder Linden, um, John Lester, who's a, a very uh, uh, old timey and big guy when it comes to education in virtual worlds and just virtual worlds in general. And for a long time, he was a Thanksgiving turkey with a pilgrim cat. And now, um, when you see him, he actually has uh, an avatar. And Shana is saying they actually found um, something for that. They came up with something called Bake on Mesh. So you can use old skin on mesh, uh, but it's still experimental. Well, it's good. It's great that they're... Um, it's great that they're uh, uh, doing that. Thanks, Ellie, for the, for the um, link to the uh, community thing on Baking on Mesh. Um, I, I will be very happy to go in that direction at some point, but right now I, I don't like to get rid of my favorite stuff. Okay, so I'm going back now to the next slide, and this is playing and learning on virtual worlds. And I'm, I, I just think um, this, this is a way to uh, reinforce the notion that there's a lot to be said for playing. When I was first in Second Life, um, my husband would, was coming in at the time and doing all the landscaping and stuff. And while I was working on my various projects, um, the Azire Library was the first one, um, he would go off around the grid and he'd find casinos that he liked and musical live music ven uh, venues that he thought were good, places that would be a good place to dance, scenic uh, ballrooms made in, the, in uh, kind of an ornate uh, Baroque style, you know, beautiful, beautiful areas to go explore, um, cathedrals and cities and trains that went around um, various areas. My, our favorite train was the train through Jalisco, um, virtual Jalisco. And you get a lot out of that too, especially if you're working on something that requires you to be working on a couple of screens and you're, you know, setting something up that's kind of for your teaching or for the course you're taking, you can go plunk your avatar in a 1950s dive bar and let them dance away while you're listening to some wonderful music. It's also a great way to meet people and it's a great way to bring people together. Um, it's, it's, and if you stand up at your desk and start dancing along, it's great exercise too. That's kind of the principle behind the whole brain health exercise programs is that they have, uh, you have your avatar going through a routine on the screen and you're also kind of doing that as well out in the world. So don't forget to play. There are a lot of great places to look for. There's some theme parks, there's roller coasters, there's all kinds of great places that you can go and just let off some steam. So I don't have a slide for the final bit of this, which is talking a little bit about equipment. And what I can say is, is that as a teacher, you really need to kind of have uh, something that, that will take the, the, gra the graphic strain of Second Life. And partly why I got into DigiWorld is that it's a little bit less uh, hoggy of graphics. It's, it's a little bit more simple, more like the early Second Life, although it, it's getting, you know, close. But you, I started out with a regular uh, laptop, and I was on Second Life for quite a while. I was learning, and I was on the laptop for quite a while. I was learning how to teach online. I was attending all the ISTE, um, um, all the ISTE uh, uh, events and all the VISTE events, going to lectures, going to discussion groups, joining book groups. 
Um, I was sitting my avatar down in libraries and clicking through all of the books on the shelf and seeing what was there and picking up uh, in information. I was touring the history of Second Life um, Sim. I was doing all this kind of stuff on a regular basis, kind of getting to know what online teaching was about and what the affordances of teaching in a, in, in a vibrant environment like a virtual world. And I was, I was on there maybe five hours a day, three or four days a week for a couple of months. And I basically killed the graphics card in my laptop and otherwise fried other bits of it and had to get a new one. The second one that I got, what I uh, uh, kind of expanded my budget and got a computer that had a better graphics card, that had more graphics memory, that had more memory on the, um, you know, more uh, storage memory in the in the laptop and a bigger screen. I went from an old 10-inch screen to about a 14, 15-inch screen. My laptop that I have now that I don't use very much is a 17-inch screen, but I'd gone up to a bigger screen. So I was beginning to get into this territory, although I didn't think of it at the time as a gamer's territory, um, because I wasn't really gaming. I was uh, the only game I played was Civilization, which uh, at the time was not very graphics uh, hungry, and um, occasionally I would play SimCity. But basically, I wasn't really playing virtual games anymore. I was in Second Life. And I uh, had begun to be, I volunteered to be a member of the uh, social committee for ISTE, and I, I, was, I volunteered for a very brief time for VISTE, and I started to get involved with other groups and have my own events and all that kind of stuff. I was over here in Chilbo, running the library, keeping the library hours. So... Um, I, again, was on that laptop. Now, it lasted a couple of years longer than the first one did, but it definitely uh, burnt out the card eventually. Um, and at that point, I got a desktop, and I got a regular desktop, and I used that in uh, the office that we were in. We were at University of Virginia at that point. And I used that desktop. I had a 27-inch screen, and I could go on during the day um, because that was my deal uh, with that that unit, I had a lot of freedom in terms of what I did during the day. I could go on during the day and work on projects and, and do some things for uh, classes I was in or classes I was going to be teaching, um, discussion forums especially I was doing. And and that uh, did never, never died, <laughs> but it had difficulty multitasking. Um, if I wanted to be uh, searching the internet for images, having up my paint program to work on those images, having my PowerPoint up so that I could make a PowerPoint or I could make illustrations that I was then going to transfer as textures to Second Life, it really couldn't do all of that at once. So I had to kind of change the way that I did things. The next time I bought a computer, which was this last time, I started to think about gaming computers. When you see, initially gaming computers were ridiculously expensive, and now you can get some relatively cheap ones, and as long as you have a good power source, which I had to replace in mine, I bought a very cheap gaming uh, desktop. Um, you can you can get something that's got a lot of heft to it. It's got great graphics. It's it it's got a processing speed that's going to work. It's you can set it up with one, two, or three screens that you can work on. So you can have your note card uh, library on Word over at one spot. Your Google open, picking up um, URLs. Your PowerPoint ready to make images. Your Paint program, and in the center screen, there you are in Second Life or Digital Worlds or wherever, pulling all of these things to pull them together. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Ra, that's that's great advice. Have an IT guy build the tower, cheaper than buying one built and more powerful. Community college, check your local community college. He says these folks build will build you a machine for minimal cost. That's a really good idea. I wish I'd done that. <laughs> The good news for me was I picked up a gaming uh, a gaming machine, which was kind of hysterical. It didn't have as many colors on it as some of them, because some of them are red, and you can look inside, and they're all snazzy. Um, so it was one of the more calm gaming machines, and I spent about 500 bucks, which was not very much. 
But within about three months of daily use, because I was teaching at the time uh, in my own teaching practice and also uh, for North Central University where I work part time, um, and the power source gave out. And I really didn't have enough um, storage for the videos I was making either. And I found a guy, got a recommendation from a friend of mine, and I found a guy, uh, through her, I found a guy here in the area who came in, cleaned it up, took a look at it, got me a new power supply, got me a spare, uh, spare um, um, hard drive, and kind of, you know, worked on the, the various configurations so that I would get the most, uh, the most bang for my buck. And now it's been at least... Uh, two or three years um i think it's been even it might even be four years it's uh well it doesn't matter but i i think it's about three or four years since i had had him do that and we get him back every once in a while to clean them out and take a look and kind of help keep them going and so i have now two screens one is a tv actually <laughs> with my uh, my mother-in-law's uh, tv uh, before she passed and that's a 27 inch and then I have a 22 inch computer monitor and then I have an additional computer as well that I use for email and stuff. But I can go back and forth from tons of programs open now and be able to have this flow of, of work that doesn't, um, it doesn't take as much time as it used to. Didn't help me yesterday because I had so much else to do and was trying to set up the virtual MOOCs. Um, website so I didn't get this done on time but that's my comment about about equipment is that as you go along if you start if you're just learning and exploring um, you may not need to go gaming if you're teaching as well it's not a bad idea if you're developing I'm sure you guys who are developers would have even better um, recommendations for what you need but it's it's even if you want to stay on the trailing edge and do refurbished and all that stuff like I do, you can still pick up stuff that are that's going to have much more staying power um, than uh, the the computer you had before. I uh, uh, gaming laptops are extremely expensive, so I don't actually. Um, I don't actually recommend that. Yeah, Duncan, that's true. You have to pay for powerhouse PCs. So if you get on, as a teacher, if you get on kind of the, the trailing edge of powerhouse, <laughs> so not too powerful, but better than the average um, uh, off-the-shelf laptop, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find um, you're better off. If you're going to be doing a lot of stuff, you'll find you're better off in that. And it also, it's helped me in terms of, um, how well I can, how well I do my work on my, my teaching academy. And, and um, it also has helped me coordinate the work that I do from North Central University because we also need to have several things open at once as we're doing the grading and trying to get in touch with students and all that kind of stuff. It's always great to have more than one screen. Yes, gaming, uh, right, right, lots of processing power. Right, and you can get some really good gaming laptops that are refurbished, I must say. Um, uh, but at the time, I, I literally had 500 bucks, and that was it. And I was able to get this tower with a couple of hundred dollars of fixes from um, uh, my computer guy. Uh, turned out to be a, a real lasting uh, tool for me. Um, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, um, Equinus, a Christian, is saying a powerful computer for SL is no longer needed, needed possibly for Sensar, yes. But you have to think about, you have to think as well about, um, you know, what kind of things you're using. Cami Rembrandt, who is a, a builder, Cami Elias is her real name. She's a, a teacher of English, and she has the story, uh, the story, um, storytelling little uh, pavilion next to the freebie store uh, just across the way from the uh, virtual headquarters. She has, uh, it, she takes a, a smaller laptop with her when she goes out traveling and is not really able to get into Second Life very effectively. So it, when she's home or when she's more settled and has um, her regular equipment available, then she's better to do it. But even now, um, uh, there's a problem with some of the smaller devices that you want to use. Um, and Selby is 
saying, I recommend solid state drive now. I used gaming machines for years, but my most recent desktop is just an ordinary desktop with a solid state drive. That's fantastic. That's great advice as well. So, so oh, and Dex is saying at least eight gigabytes RAM. Yep, 64 bit. Yep, NVIDIA GT530. I've got an NVIDIA GT, but I, I can't remember the number. To get high preset in Second Life, at least two core. I'm a four core over here. Um, but yeah, absolutely, eight megabytes of RAM. Stella is saying I use an Asus, ASUS, that has both and a very strong graphics for 4K. Excellent. We're getting some good advice here. So basically, my, my main things are explore, talk to people, don't feel bad if you need to take an afternoon or an evening or a couple of full days if you've got some time to do that, and just explore as much as you can and take a look. At, keep your keep your landmarks, organize your inventory, and I've got an inventory uh, organization YouTube video from a previous playlist that I'll put up in, in our current playlist. Um, and invest a little bit in PayPal or whatever uh, also comes in that allows you to buy a few things here and there in Second Life. And if you can afford premium, that's up to you. Uh, that allows you to buy land, but you can rent land. Um, from people, and as long as you have a little bit of PayPal source uh, for the cash, you're okay there. And then think about the equipment that you've got if you're going to go, if you're going to go kind of more professional. If you're going to be taking courses or teaching courses or building, think about the type of computer you've got, how much you use it, how much it has going. Duncan is saying he recommends 16 RAM, but he runs 64 gigabyte RAM on his PC. But you're a, you're a developer, right, Duncan? So you've got the good stuff. Well, so that's my that's my talk for today. And um, I just if you've got any questions, either in the, um, in the uh, um, Zoom or here in Second Life, please uh, put them in the chat. N Nellie, if you could get back on audio and you can read me if there's any questions in there. Um, Shana is saying, I don't think they allow everyone to link to PayPal. Um, there are, there is another option these days, and I can't think of what it's called. Uh, uh, is it Skrill? Some of you might know better than me. Uh, your region or your country, yeah. And Ra's at 32 RAM. Oh, I can see, can I see the? Yeah, I'm looking for questions, man. I'm here. Oh, okay. Does anybody have any questions or any more comments to make? So I hope this was helpful. It's not very academic. You're going to get a lot of uh, talks that are, are tours of installations that will inspire you as we go through the course. Um, and I, I hope that uh, this gave you, especially if you're a newcomer, some ideas. We've got a lot of folks here to help. It is being recorded. Now it's, it's Right now it's being live streamed. Of, um, uh, live on Facebook and the Facebook live will be available afterwards and Nellie is also turning the Facebook lives into YouTube videos as well um, and then uh, oh Judy is saying I'm managing to run SL on my Chromebook that's fantastic Duncan says I have an SL uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. let me go back and get my I think I should make my chat box a little bit bigger so I can see everything Duncan says, I have an SL island that is closed that I teach on with my high school students. If there's another high school teacher and would like to teach an SL with high school students, talk to me. I would. Who's that? <laughs> Great. I'm uh, looking for each other, guys. <laughs> I'm looking for junior high, even lower. Ah, uh, well, yes. there are people. For there are people. I mean, Andy and uh, Andy Wheelock, who's... Um, Spit yeah, I know Andy. He's a friend. Yeah, yeah. Andy is a good, good person to get in touch with. Yeah, I will. Um, thank you, Beth, for coming. And Dex is saying I have my free account linked to PayPal for buying Lindens. 
So thank you everybody for coming along and thank you for your patience with my last minute getting things pulled together. I will have this, uh, I will make the decision today, I promise, on the, on the display land and I will have the PowerPoint up there. It will also be available on SlideShare. I'll put the link in a box, a giver box. I have another giver, giver box that I will put out with a slide, uh, slide can show. Can you, well. I was just thinking, can you add it to the, to the uh, Google Drive doc? And then I yes. can pick it from there and I'll add it to the Moodle as well. So they'll have it on the Moodle. They'll have it on. So anyone who yes, comes to the Google I'll Doc. And I'll also will be put able the, to get it. the note cards there as well so that you've got the text. Um, and I just wanted to mention that Thinker uh, Selby is saying visit me on the web, drop, drop by my web offices weekdays, 12 to 12 30 p.m. Central. Cyber Lounge and 3D Web Worlds orientation rooms. We're going to have two presentations about Web Worlds later in the Virtual World MOOC. He's Selby will be in both places, so you can, all you need to you need to speak to get his attention. Web Worlds, 3D Worlds run in a browser. You don't need a viewer. Um, and they visit the writer's workshop on the web. Don't register, enter as a guest. So please friend up with each other, friend up with Selby, and um, have a great day.